ladies and germs. February 18th, 1943, the uh, German Nazi regime executed a couple of German youth, a sister and brother by the name of Sophie and Hans Scholl. Now, you know, calling them youth is, you know, applicable in that, you know, I believe that they were in the early 20s. Uh, so they weren't teenagers. But needless to say, man, they executed uh, this brother and sister for crimes against the state, you know. And you may, you may say to yourself, well, what crimes? What crimes might have these German youth committed against the Nazi party? Well, it was the crime of criticizing the Nazi regime via, like, info tracks that they would put together and that they would anonymously and secretly, you know, maybe under the cover of night, like, right, with their hoodie on, they would go out and they would leave these leaflets in criticism of the Nazi regime in different towns. And it was not only uh, Sophie and Hans Scholl that were doing this, but it was a group of teenagers or a group of young people that uh, had formed this collective, if you will, called the White Rose. And in their... The druthers was to see the German people rise up against uh, the, you know, fascist dictatorship of the Nazi regime. You know, it, it is a, a kind of uh, racial fascism, right? The racial fascism of the Nazis. So t t today is, I believe today is like the 8th of February, the 8th or 9th. And so the 18th of February commemorates uh, the murder of this brother and sister. And uh, so I'm going to do a series of videos about them this week into next week. I'm not going to, I'm not going to like go off the deep end about it, but I'm going to do a series of videos commemorating and remembering these two. And um, how I'm going to do that? Well, what, what I'm doing is I'm reading a book here. <laughs> I'm reading a book called uh, The White Rose. Uh, it's called At the Heart of the White Rose. And so what this is, is thankfully, it is not somebody uh, giving their assessment, their opinion of who these kids were, but rather it is, a, it is a collection of their letters and their diary entries, letters that they wrote to, to one another and to friends and to their and diary entries uh, that both of them kept diaries, journal entries. Uh, and so then you discover, you discover the heart of the white rose, right? You discover the heart of the white rose. And you would think that something so notable as uh, a, the, a youth resistance movement against uh, the Nazi regime in the 1940s and the execution of two of their main cohorts, right? You would think that something as notable as that would be well understood as to what is, what was the heart of the White Rose? What motivated them? You know, what was the, what, who were they, who, who were these kids, man, that got themselves executed by the, by the Nazis? Who were these German kids that weren't, that weren't Jewish? Okay. Who were these German kids that weren't Jewish that got themselves executed by the Nazis, by their own government at that time? You think that the answer to that would be clear and apparent? And I tell you what, the answer to that is clear and apparent when you read, when you read their letters, when you read, you know, their own words, then it's apparent, it's evident what they were about. 
But when you go online, as is the case, what you find in the history of the White Rose is a watered down telling of events that, if you will, almost tries to take these youth and make them a mirror image of the modern political sensibilities of activist youth today. People like to use the White Rose today and be like, and they like to place them in this heroic status of which they ought, they deserve. Don't get me wrong, but they like to use the White Rose as a kind of correlation for leftist activism on university campuses, you know, speaking truth to power, to suppose that there's a kindred spirit there. You know, I've, I've seen this in the uh, Free Hong Kong uh, revolution of our time, Free Hong Kong democracy protesters, you know, in the, in the 2019 and 2020, and people think that there's a kindred spirit there. American leftist activist youth think that there's a kindred spirit between them and the free Hong Kong protesters. And uh, if you just look at what the free Hong Kong protesters were about, you find the disconnect between the sensibilities of, you know, American leftist activism, right, is concern, concerns itself with entirely different issues, truth be told. Truth be told. But ne nonetheless, um, so what, what you find when you look up the White Rose is that there will be, um, it, it, it will be supposed that they are resisting, that their, their purpose was to resist the Nazis for the same reasons that history looks back with 2020 vision and judges the Nazi regime, right? But, you know, keep in mind that these youth we're in the midst of the history as it unfolded. You know, it's always easier to look back and to judge because then the deal is done, right? The chip, the cards are on the table and what is, is apparent. But when you're in the midst of the moment, when you're in the throes of history as it is unfolding, it is often not always so evident, not always so clear for people. That's why there were so many American progressives that embraced the Nazi regime in the 1930s. American leftist progressives fawned all over Adolf Hitler and his eugenics vision of a greater society, right? And that is a fact. <laughs> and that, ladies and gentlemen, is a fact, <laughs> right? That's a fact. And of course, after the, you know, after the death camps were exposed and revealed and the, the film record did the rounds, people go into the movies theater and they'd see these like reels of what, the death camps look like when they liberated the death camps and people were, and then the American progressives got, you know, you know, like they got cold, they got pale and they were like, we have to change how people understand progressivism. We cannot be associated with this. Right. Anyway. Right. So, so Sophie and Hans Scholl, 
They were in the midst of it, man. They were in the thick of it. They were inside of Germany. In fact, Scholes was a Hans Scholes was a was a medic for the German army and he spent times he spent time on the Russian front lines, right? And a lot of his anti-Nazi sentiment came from his experience uh, on the on the front lines with the German army fighting the Russians. Anyway, so the question though, the question at hand is, you know, what what were what motivated Sophie Scholes, Hans Scholes, what motivated them? What were they about? And what you will find online, what you will find on the internet, for the most part, is a kind of secularized generic telling of their struggle their endeavors, their activism, right? Their organized action against the Nazi regime in, you know, 1941, 1942. You know, the White Rose might have really come into, into its own in 1942, 1943. But uh, needless to say, what you find online is that there, there will be an acknowledgement to a degree to a certain degree, there is some acknowledgement uh, as to the as to the real motivations, but it is downplayed in exchange for a kind of secularization and a kind of whitewashing of the history to make it palpable and applicable to modern sensibilities. And we can be like, "Oh, these kids were just like us," you know. These kids acted uh, on the same ambitions that. Uh, activism in the college campuses today acts, you know, that there's, there's this common, this is, they suppose that there's a kindred spirit while, but in so doing, in so doing, overlook who these kids were. And let me just cut to the chase. Who these kids were is they, these kids were Christians. These kids not only were Christians, but they were vehemently Christian, devoutly Christian. And how can I say that? Look at their writings. Look at their diary, diary entries. This book almost reads as a Christian devotional. And I'm just reading their diary entries and their letters to one another and is almost akin to a Christian devotional. You know, that's how Christian these kids were. Everything that they were talking about, everything that motivated them was about God, the goodness of God, the truth of God, standing for what is true in the midst of a crooked and perverse and fallen generation of society of which they saw the Nazis as just the antithesis of, you know, the evil that men are capable of. The evil that men are capable of. So when we think today that, you know, there are people today that will think that Sophie and Hans Scholl were somehow like Antifa, anti-fascist, right? And it's like, it's like when people say that it's derived from a meme, it's derived from an Instagram photo that they saw, it's derived from, you know, a Wikipedia page. And even Wikipedia acknowledges the theological undertones of Hans and, and Sophie Scholes. But then it goes on to talk about the White Rose and how the White Rose was, was uh, you know, multifaceted and there was all these different religious beliefs inside the White Rose. And they'll be like, well, there were Lutherans and there were Catholics. And it's like, oh, okay, so, so diverse. You know, because it's only it's 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 in 2023 that we're all concerned about diversity. And so we have to then superimpose our concerns of diversity onto the past and be like, see, they were diverse. It's like, what do you mean they were diverse, man? This was their circle of friends. And what bound them together was not diversity. What bound them together was a faith in God. 
That's what bound them together. What animated them to put themselves in harm's way was not diversity, but a faith, their faith in God and their belief in a true and virtuous and righteous God. A savior of wretched men. And Hans Scholl's, Sophie Scholl's writings are littered with their sentiments. Littered with their sentiments. So in uh, February 18th, 1943, uh, the Nazis were able to lay hold of, of Han Scholes and Sophie Scholes. They got caught. Uh, they got caught distributing their uh, leaflets on a university campus, I think like on a weekend or something like that. It was a weekend. People weren't in class. And they got caught. And so uh, I believe... I believe it was the next day they were executed. They were tried and executed the following day, if, if I'm seeing that right. Or, or if not, the following day, the day after. You know? And it was that quick. And in fact, I think when Sophie was walked to the gallows, they, they had a what do you call it? A guillotine. They cut off their heads from her cell to the severing of her head was like a minute. It was like that. But you know, one of the things that, that you'll find is that like the executioner said of Sophie that he never saw a person die that go to their death more bravely, more stoically than she did. You know, and, and like I said, I'm going to do a series of videos on this and I'll, I'll dig up some of their quotes. You know, Sophie had this amazing quote that she, what she spoke before, she, before they, they cut off her head, before they killed her. Some fine words, man, that dropped from her, her tongue on that day as she bravely, you know, went to be with her maker uh, and no doubt rewarded for the position she took. So... Here, here's here's so so to wrap this video up. Um, I came across something in reading this, one of the writings, one of the things that Sophie wrote. I think she wrote this in her diary. Is this a diary entry? Yeah. And she wrote this February tenth, nineteen forty two. So almost a year before her death, almost to the day. So she was executed and. February 18th, 1943. So this is February. Oh, it's February 12th. February 12th, 1942. It's almost a year prior. This is what she wrote. And we're going to look at this. Like I said, I'm going to do a series of videos here looking at the things that these, these kids had to say. Let's see here. She says, I've decided to pray in church every day so that God won't forsake me. Although I don't yet know God and feel sure that my conception of him is utterly false, he'll forgive me if I ask him. If I can love him with all of my soul, I shall lose my distorted view of him. When I look at the people around me and also at myself, I feel awed by humanity because God came down to earth for its sake. On the other hand, this is what always strikes me as most incomprehensible. Yes, what I understand least about God is his love. But what if I didn't know about it? Well, what if I did not know about it? Oh Lord, I need so badly to pray to ask. So she's saying here, she's, she's saying that she's decided to pray in church every day, right? So that God won't forsake her. And she confesses, you know, that she doesn't understand God. To know God is, 
is beyond knowing. But then she says, if I can love him. So then therein is the issue. And herein is the point. But she, I, she says, I cannot understand God. But yet she does understand that God came down to earth for our sake. Right? This she does understand. But she says, that I, I do not understand God. But if I can love God with all of my soul, that this will, this will make up for my lack of understanding. But more specifically, she goes on to say, how incomprehensible is the love of God? And then she says, oh Lord, I need so badly to pray, to ask. In context, it must be that she is saying to pray, to ask, to know the love of God. She wants to know the love of God. The question here is the incomprehensibility of, of the love of God. And even at the beginning, that she feels that she does not know God. So she will see, she chooses then that she will seek him, that she may find him. She will reach out to him, that she may lay hold of something that God has for her. She will seek that she may find, that she will ask that the door may be opened, right? That she may know the love of God. And and so I find this, if we are to talk about kindred spirits or trying to find, you know, what is the core motivation of the white rose, here in Sophie's writing, she wants to know the love of God. And she's seeking to know the love of God. Interestingly, when the German authorities laid hold of her, uh, my understanding is that the deal was if she drops the goods on her fellow white rose activists, if she drops the goods on her friends, essentially, if she drops the goods on her friends, they will let her go home. She'll be good. Like, you know, we're going to let you go. You're young, whatever. All you need to do is knock off your friends. And she chose to stay silent. She would say nothing. In fact, both her and her brother, Hans, took the full blame for the activities of the White Rose. They wouldn't knock off their friends. And so, in so doing, they lost their lives within hours, right? It was short. It was to the point. You, will you knock off your friends? No. Execute them. And here's the thing. The Bible says that no greater love does, than, does a man have than this, than to lay down his life for his friends. But the scripture goes on to say, but... And though we did not know God, Jesus laid down his life for us. Right? So isn't it interesting, almost a year to the day before Sophie is executed by the Nazi regime in 1943, that she wants to understand the love of God. And truly, not only did she understand it, but she lived it in laying down her life for her friends. You understand? That she, un she discovered, she wanted to know the love of God and it was presented to her. That it was presented to her to lay down her life for her friends. And that's exactly what she did. You know? For truth, for the solidarity of her friends, she would not defy, right? What she knew to be good, what she knew to be right, what she knew to be true. At, at cost of her own life. So, I found that interesting. I found that really interesting. And you'll never, I'll tell you what, you, you can look all over the internet. You're never going to find this quote. You're never going to find anyone show you this quote. 
but I'm showing it to you here, right? And like I said, so if you end up getting this book uh, at the heart of the White Rose, Letters and Diaries of Hans and Sophie Scholes, uh, this is on this quote that I read to you is on page 209 at the bottom of the page. Page 209 at the bottom of the page. Um, so I'm going to keep reading her diary entry just in closing here. In fact, I'm going to pick up, pick up kind of where we started on it and I'm going to just finish reading it because I, I took her, I took her quote and, and didn't finish the full context of her, of her diary entry. When I look at the people around me and also at myself, I feel awed by human by humanity because God came down to earth for its sake. On the other hand, this is all this always strikes me as most incomprehensible. Yes, what I understand least about God is his love. But what if I didn't know about it? Oh Lord, I need so badly to pray to ask. Yes, one should always bear in mind when dealing with other people that God became man in, on, uh, on their account. To think that one feels too good to condescend to many, to many of them, what arrogance, what on earth did I get it from? So she's saying like when she thinks less of people, when she thinks condescendingly of other people. Maybe, maybe this here is even, to a degree, a, a, a response to the kind of the, the eugenics propaganda. You know, when she says to, to look down on others condescendingly, to see people as less than I, than, than myself, that eugenics mindset, that, that racial eugenics mindset, social Darwinian science, which was so popular back then, so much rhetoric. And she's, and she's like, she's even admitting, you know, when she, she's like, and I, and how is it that I look down on other people? Oh, the arrogance of it. What on earth, where on earth did I get it from? Trying to shed those things of society, man, that get on us. Those things that we hear in the world, the propaganda of the world, and it gets into our heads. You know, and yet she is acknowledging that God came down on the, for the sake of humanity. Right? Not to reward humanity, but to save humanity from its own self-created ruin. Right? Us each as individuals. If anyone is a victim, we are victims of the things that we do because we will give an account of ourselves, right? Not of others. You know, when you stand before God one day, you will not give an account to God of your government. You will not give account of, to God of the social programs that failed you, right? How you fell through the fabric of, of society and the problems of your life. No, you will give an account of yourself, right? We will give an account of ourselves to God and it's right, it for this miserable circumstance to which men find themselves. Pitiful, faithless, godless condition that men find themselves. That Jesus came down to die on a cross for our sins. Anyway, uh, God bless. Stay true. Uh, be be watching for the next video in this series of videos commemorating the life and death of Hans Scholl and Sophie Scholl. All right. God bless. Be true.